Okay, what are we gonna do in the real estate market? It's quite horrible right now. And if you're thinking about transacting in real estate, I don't think it makes sense right now, unless you're one of these six scenarios. And we'll go through the scenarios right now. Past October, there's only 4,600 sales, or just over 4,600 sales in all of the GTA. And for context, a normal market would be about 10,000 transactions. At the peak, we saw about 13,000 transactions right when the government of Canada or the Bank of Canada dropped their rates down to historic lows, right? 0.25% overnight lending rate, which translated to like one or 2% interest rates at the time, if you guys remember that. So of course, everybody jumped in and bought houses. And if you remember times like that, there was, you know, any given property, there'd be 10 offers, 20 offers, even 50 offers. That was kind of normal. It's kind of expected. So I think if the rates ever did come back down, we'll start seeing that again. I don't think there'll be a crazy frenzy. And I don't think definitely rates won't go back down to the one or 2% that we saw before, you know, maybe about 4%, you know, it's better than 6% that we see now. But if that ever were to happen, the reason why I think that things will kind of get crazy again is because obviously immigration is happening. There is a demand curve. So if you bring the rates down, people can buy again, people can afford to buy again, they'll pass the stress tests and uh, you know, people legitimately have to move because of various reasons. So let's get into three negative reasons of why people are moving right now or transacting right now, whether it's buying or selling in real estate. And just for simplicity's sake, I'll start with the letter D. So the first one is a death. So it's quite unfortunate, but you know, people die, we don't live forever. And the thing is you can't take the property with you when you go, right? Wherever you go to. So if you're leaving behind a property for next of kin, you know, a spouse or kids or relative or friends even for that matter, luckily I wish I had a friend that, actually I don't wish anybody died, but you know what I mean. There might be an estate sale where if you inherited a property and you either can't pay the taxes, the probate taxes to cover the inheritance, or maybe it is tax sheltered or maybe it's in a trust or something, but you just don't have use for the property right? You don't want to manage it. You don't want to become a landlord or the state of repairs is just too much to deal with. And there's a chance in those cases where you would want to sell the property. And those people potentially could be using the money to have a little more, you know, with the bond rates right now at 5%, 6%, the GICs, I should say, it's risk-free. You're not dealing with tenant issues. You're not dealing with noise complaints. You're not dealing with overcrowding. You're not dealing with any of that missed rent you're just gonna get a good five or 6% on the money that you lend to them, right? Or to the Bank of Canada or the government of Canada or whatever bond you choose to, or GIC you choose to invest in. So I think that's a great way to kind of liquefy that. And those are the people that are transacting that I see. Another common one I see are, are divorces. It's quite nasty to be in a divorce. Obviously I've never been in one and I hope not to be in one, but uh, I've seen some clients in some, and you know, there's times where you'd have a listing agent on one side and then another listing agent representing the other spouse and just communicating to each other with that. And then also there's lawyers involved and it just gets really messy. So there's situations where one partner can't buy out the other and uh, they just have to liquidate the property. Or in the case where you're divorcing somebody, but you're in the same property with that person, whether you're renting or you're buying something and you just want it in your own place, right? Then there's a chance that those people are transacting in real estate as well too. Then there's the case of debt, which is a nasty D as well too. With the rise of rates, as you saw in my last video, the rise of rates is just decimated the carrying costs, whether you're paying a variable rate and you feel the immediate impact, or if you're one of the many borrowers that have a renewal coming up, and I'd say the other half is coming up for renewal by 2025, I think it is. Those people, they're not used to the payment shocks. And even though rents have gone up, the cost of rent that have gone up to, it, it's not gonna carry the cost of the carrying costs with maintenance and taxes and you know anything else that you have to pay for maintaining a property. So those people are deciding to sell. You know, thankfully there's enough equity in the property from, you know, there's been a run up in prices. So there is some money and they're not really focusing on the gap of losing what the price is from the peak. They're looking at the gain of what they got from when they bought it, let's just say, right? So some of these people are selling and um, there's people that are actually selling at a loss too, right? So, you know, for some assignment sales where they're just willing to walk away from the deposit even altogether and potentially even kick some money in, like those are the people that are transacting as well too. And obviously if you're a buyer, you see an opportunity, you're gonna buy it at a certain price. I find those sellers that are distressed are, it's an unfortunate situation to be in, it's just, the situation we're in so we have to sell right and uh 
that's what it is. But not every seller is distressed. Like I said, there could be some equity in there. And yes, you might not have gotten the amount you would have gotten in the past, but at least you're still up a little bit and then you can recycle that money. Now let's move to the other positive side of the 60s of why people are transacting real estate. Now there are situations where obviously, you know, people have kids and they're not gonna hold back. So that's called diapers, right? Where you need an extra bedroom. Like our example, we have three kids and the previous house was just too small. Like there's no way we could have made it work. We needed that extra bedroom unless we were to bunk beds, which I guess could have happened in hindsight. But looking forward now, it's better that everybody has own room. So we needed that extra bedroom. That jump from the three to four bedrooms does come at a significant cost, unfortunately. So people are transacting if you have diapers, right? New additions to the families. Or it could be that you just need maybe um, the same category as that you work from home now and you just can't make working at the kitchen table work anymore and you just want an office, your own dedicated office space, whether it's in the basement or a separate room or maybe you have an in-law coming in as well too. I would say expanding families is probably the category that we're looking at here. The other thing is, let's say you can imagine two people get together and maybe two people are renting and you do have some money saved up but it's not a, a lot of money, right? And the other person's in the same boat and you combine forces, it's almost like getting a roommate and then you go buy something, right? Let's call that diamonds. So let's call it like an engagement, some sort of proposal where you're now you're joining two families into one family and making a union and you have the purchasing power of two people as well too. So those are the people buying properties right now in fact, actually, if they're buying something, they're probably going to sell something as well, too, if they're later in their stage up the property ladder as well. So those people are transacting real estate and what a better time. Like there's no better time to transact in real estate for that because there are deals out there. Now, I know the carrying costs are pretty high, so it might just offset it. And um, even though prices have come down about 15, 20 percent, maybe the cost of carrying is actually higher. The monthly payments are actually higher than what they were in the past which is crazy. But you know, again, that's the situation we're in right now. The height of the rates right now, it won't last forever. It can't last forever. There's so many things failing. I mean, look around you, look at all the developers that are going bankrupt and all the businesses that are shutting down and all the restaurants that are closing. And even with the shrinkflation with the groceries and you know, restaurants and tip inflation as well too, like everything's just getting more expensive. And I just don't think with the height of the cost of borrowing for everything like that, it's just like too many parts of the economy will fail. So they eventually will come down and maybe now is the right time to buy it. Like, look, ultimately you don't want to time the market. You can't just, like, you don't know when the bottom is and no one has a crystal ball. Rates can go up again tomorrow, who knows, right? Like based on the economic indicators that the Bank of Canada sees. And if they see that inflation is still getting out of control and we're not on track to hit our targets, then they're going to raise rates, right? And, you know, in the last uh, rate hike cycle, they said in their notes that housing is one of the causes of inflation and you can't control it like they, they can't tame it you know um, and ultimately it comes to supply and demand factors we have so many people coming to Canada every year that it's just they all need a place to live right if we have half a million people coming as permanent residents and maybe another half million as non-permanent residents or no cap on non-permanent residents and we're over a million people coming to Canada every year yet we only have you know 250,000 homes being like housing starts every year or housing completions around the same as well too so that doesn't make sense, right? Like if you think about it, if you have a million people coming into the country, 250,000 housing starts, and let's call it two and a half people per house, 2.6 people I think it is for the latest census data. That's 650,000 homes that we'll need, but we're only producing 250,000. Like something's gotta give here, right? Like people are gonna have to either live in multi-unit houses or combine forces and live with roommates. And in fact, actually we're seeing a lot of rental applications with two different families living together. You know, it could be two couples, four people living into one place. That's that's kind of crazy. And then the last motivator, I guess people come to Canada for, for many, many reasons. Uh, one of them being that it is safe. There is, it was a land of opportunities. You know, there still is opportunities, but if you compare this to the rest of the world where there's so much turmoil going on with just no resolution to the conflict, people killing each other through wars and it's, it's horrible. So in Canada, at least we have freedoms, we have rights. Sure, cost of living is high, but you know, that goes for anywhere in any other major city in the world. If you're looking at Toronto specifically, yeah, it's expensive here, but there's other parts of Canada that aren't so expensive. And sure, maybe the jobs aren't there, but maybe there's remote work that you could find. Ultimately, our doors are open for immigration due to the economic class, that is people that are gonna to contribute to our economy. 
And then there's also the humanitarian reasons that people are allowed in as well too. But for the most part, Canada is a great place to live. Like I'm actually really grateful to be born here and to be living here compared to the other parts of the world that I've seen and other parts of the world that we see in the news. Yeah, you might say propaganda and all that stuff, but I've been to some other countries in the world and I don't know, I think Canada is great, right? Like, yes, we have our problems, but so do other countries as well too. So people do come here for relocation, for jobs, for a better life. Maybe the family members are here. Maybe it's better education for their kids as well too. But ultimately we're meeting those targets of 500,000 a year. So that last one is called distance. So the last D, six Ds of real estate is distance. And these people are coming into Canada and moving here and they're the ones transacting. Now in Toronto, it's a little bit difficult to buy something in Ontario specifically because of the ban on foreign buyers. Now, if you come here on a work permit or study permit, you are allowed to buy now. The federal government did reverse that rule this year because of our economy just slumping a little bit. And I think it was too much overkill to realize that foreign buyers can't buy here. And you know what? Foreign buyers aren't even the problem of why our prices are so high. Fundamentally, it just comes down to supply and demand. So if you're relocating here on a work permit or study permit, you can buy. Just the, the problem is Ontario, you have to pay a 25% tax on the purchase in addition to land transfer taxes, in addition to, you know, mortgage charges, if you have a mortgage, you know, any kind of adjustments, let's call it 5% for land transfer taxes and closing costs and another 25% for the, um, the tax you have to pay as a non-resident in Canada, like a foreign owner, basically. Yes, you get that 25% back, but to pay 30% 30, 30 upfront, in addition to the already high purchase price, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. You know, depending on where you're from in, in parts of the world, there's other parts of the world that are more expensive. And if you're coming to Canada and you have the means to come to a different country and pick up your life and relocate your entire family or even yourself, it does cost a lot of money. And maybe those people coming here are wealthy. So I've helped people buy into Canada, into Toronto, and pay that 25%. That's, that's a lot of money, but to them, you know, it's worth the price of admission. And ultimately they'll get it back when they become a permanent resident anyway. And that was their goal. So our doors are open for immigration and people are coming here and transacting in real estate for that reason. And it could be the fact that maybe you already are Canadian and just moving from a different province. You know, I've had some clients move from Montreal and uh, you know, they're saying the state of the economy isn't doing so well there. Their jobs aren't there too francophone, like, you know, it's too restrictive of the francophone policies. Like you have to learn to speak French over there or else you can't get by from what I understand. Or people moving from Vancouver or finding that the Calgary real estate market is just too overcrowded. So people are coming to Toronto as well too and buying here as well. So there you have it. Those are six D's of real estate. Uh, people are transacting in real estate. And again, you might be scratching your head. Why are people buying right now when the costs are an all time high and qualifications are just insane. So I'll run it through again. So there's death, divorce, debt, diapers, diamonds, and distance. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned to the next video and uh, the next video we'll talk about something different. Thanks.